Welcome, everybody. Happy to have you all here, both those of you who are here in person, as well as those of you who are joining us uh, from cyberspace somewhere. Um, really uh, pleased with your participation here tonight. Uh, for those of you who are new here, uh, my name is Jeff Carr. I am the uh, Senior Director of External Affairs here at the Museum of Idaho, and uh, this is Museum Club. Uh, this is uh, our lecture series, which we run actually every two weeks. Uh, however, for the most part, we run them on Thursday afternoons. Uh, we do have a schedule of our upcoming lectures uh, in the back, if you would like to see. As a matter of fact, we have one tomorrow. Uh, so Thursdays at 3 p.m. is when we normally run these. They are always free for museum members and just a small fee for uh, those of you who are not yet museum members, uh, but we, we try to bring in a wonderful variety of uh, humanities subjects, sciences subjects, current affairs, and uh, just get people talking, you know? And uh, we are uh, really pleased to be able to have a, a, a special event tonight. We, we don't do the evening events very often, uh, we do it when we have a topic that we really believe uh, will be engaging for a, a number of the members of the community. And so we're, we're happy to have you all here. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, so for those of you who are here in person, we do have some refreshments uh, over here, some uh, cookies, some coffee and water. For those of you at home, hopefully you brought your own refreshments. Um, we will have a question and answer session uh, with our presenter following her remarks. So if you could, uh, uh, if you are joining us on Zoom, you are welcome to uh, put your questions in the chat as soon as they strike you. Uh, those of you who are here in person, you're just gonna have to hold on to them for a while. Uh, and then we will have a, a robust discussion after uh, our presenter's remarks. Uh, please, if, if you are here in person, uh, turn off your phones, uh, your phones ringers at least, and uh, those of you who are joining us uh, online, let's, we'll keep yourselves muted for now. We may be able to get you asking questions uh, at the end though. And um, I think that's about it. Uh, my thanks also to uh, Caitlin Miklos, our Director of Marketing, who's joining us and who is on the AV today. We had quite the, uh, we spent about two hours getting our AV set up today. So if something is not perfect, it is not for lack of trying. And um, it, it was a Herculean effort that took a whole bunch of us. And so hopefully this works out well. This is, I think the present and the future of how we'll be running these. So anyhow, um, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our presenter today, Stephanie Walsh. Uh, she is the president of the Idaho Sustainability and Energy Coalition. Uh, in addition to that, a native of Idaho Falls, Stephanie is a licensed professional mechanical engineer with 30 years of engineering, management, and business experience. In 2005, she formed Walsh Engineering Services, a full-service engineering and architecture firm uh, that quickly grew from a one-person startup to employing around 100 technical and support personnel. Stephanie retired in 2019 and has since devoted her time to hiking, skiing, traveling, and nonprofit work, uh, which would include the Idaho Sustainability and Energy Coalition, as well as her work as a member of our board of trustees here at the Museum of Idaho. So we are grateful to have her as part of our team too. Uh, she is also a past president of the Partnership for Science and Technology here in Idaho Falls. She's a strong believer in lifelong education and has supported the formation of the College of Eastern Idaho guest lectured at local schools and lobbied for additional technical classes and certifications at the local University of Idaho campus, as well as at CEI. Stephanie believes that our quality of life in Idaho depends on valuing and sustaining the resources we currently enjoy. As a businesswoman and a daughter of fourth generation Idaho farmers, she both appreciates the natural beauty of Idaho and understands the importance of natural resources to a strong economy. She sees Idaho as poised to take an important lead in energy transition. She advocates addressing climate change head on to help Idaho build a stronger economy and protect its resources, industries, and citizens. And with that, we will turn the time over to Stephanie Walsh for climate change in Idaho. Really? <laughs>
Great. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I need to do uh, something really quick here. And I want to thank you for the nice introduction. There's a, a couple of people I want to be sure before we get started uh, to mention. Um, the majority of my board is here. I don't mean to embarrass you guys, but if you'll stand up for this crowd just really quickly, uh, Joe Mitchell, Linda Montgomery, and Julie Raymond. Kurt Muller is not here tonight. And then my friend, Steve Moody, who is, may not be on the board, but he has been a huge role in all of this. Um, the other person I want to really mention too is a, a friend of mine, um, uh, Joe Hahn. And I mentioned Joe because Joe has been a great supporter of the organization as we've gotten started. He's interested in what we're doing and why um, and open to all of this new information. And plus his economic uh, stance in the world and his viewpoint has been hugely uh, beneficial. Uh, Joe works for um, Edward Jones. And so he's also responsible for helping us uh, retire a little earlier than perhaps we thought we'd have been able to. So with that, um, let's cover again the, the title of the presentation. When I came up with that, I didn't realize that there was a bit of a double standard in what that actually meant. It sounds like climate change in Idaho, really? A little skeptical. My actual intention with that was it was just one of those really, really long weeks where all of these things kept coming at us and kept coming at us. And what it really was, was I was feeling the bop -a mole game. You guys remember this? I loved this game as a kid. Didn't ex anticipate I would be playing it so much as an adult with my daily life. But what my real intention on the title was more, it was just one more mole popping up. Climate change, really? And I think it feels that way to all of us. I think we feel very inundated by crisis after crisis, after emergency, down to murder hornets, my favorite. Um, which really is what I would call the very small mole. Um, the, right now, part of our modern problem is that they all feel like they're really a huge crisis and they feel immediate. There's the, the, the size of the crisis and then there's the immediacy of it. In climate change, I think we've been able to kick down the road in our minds at least. The world is uh, changing anyway, but we've kicked it down the road. But in reality, um, that's the big mole and it's the big mole with big teeth and it's the slow moving mole. And so it's allowed us to kind of pretend it's not there and not hit that mole very hard. But the reality is that is a big scary mole and we need to pay more attention to it. And we really need to stop and think about why, why we're having debates and discussions over so much as even the existence of climate change. And they're really actually very uh, good valid reasons. So um, also, uh, Jeff gave a little intro to me but I want to add to it a little bit. Okay, so why is that not changing there? Caitlin, you got any ideas? That was the same. Hmm. Are we still in present presentation mode? Hit escape. There we go. Thank you. Um, can, can somebody hit the chat? Let's see, I, I can look at it from here. Let's make sure two things, you can hear me and you can now see the presentation. Someone wanna let us know in the chat? Oh, thank you, Jeff. Oh, great, okay. Um, a little bit of relevant background for me is, as he mentioned, uh, Jeff mentioned, I was born and raised in Idaho on a farm in a farming family. Um, I've got a business background, two businesses and um, a nonprofit, which is technically a business too, just for a different reason. And, and that's important. Those are important because the business side is, it's really about the economics. And I, I can't help but look at problems always as to what impact is it gonna have on other people. And also, what we expect businesses and individuals to do. Um, the other part of this is an engineer. I'm an uh, engineer with really a pretty good basic understanding of the science of climate change for really over 30 years. I, when I was up at the University of Idaho getting my degree, um, I worked in the Center for Applied Thermodynamic Studies and we were working on replacements for 
the refrigerant fluids. So the Montreal Protocol was um, passed in 1987 and it banned CFCs. So in just a few years later, when I'm up there, we're already studying and we're working hard on these replacements. And, and um, it was really pretty interesting work. Does anybody know why, what the Montreal Protocol was for? Why did we ban CFCs? Whoops, we lost my screen. Well, while they figure that out, anybody know why we were banning CFCs? Ah, there we go, perfect. Holes in the ozone. So really the Montreal Protocol passed in a relatively decent amount of time. Action was happening. It was a worldwide agreement. It was a big deal. So I'm 22, 21 years old when I'm, when I'm working up there and I take an atmospheric chemistry class. So I have this background at, at the CATS lab and, and the Mo Montreal Protocol and part of this atmospheric chemistry class, and I will say kind of a small part of it actually was about uh, what they call global warming at the time. Barely hear with everything as loud as possible and we can see. Okay, I'm getting Donna telling me that we're having a hard time hearing me. I'm gonna move this up. I had that problem earlier. Others hearing okay? Somebody says, yeah. Is that a yep we can hear? Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Well, feedback is good. Um, so when we took this in atmospheric chemistry and we got to global warming, there wasn't the context that it really seems to have now. It certainly wasn't presented in any kind of a political perspective. This was basically, you know, just part of the science. We'd already been learning how the atmosphere works, um, how it basically turns a cold rock into this planet of, you know, life, and what a what a great thing um, uh, we've really got here. So, in the context of that, it really was quite different, I think, than it's presented sometimes now. And it was just very science based. Um, so, I've had that basic understanding for over thirty years, and I've watched, thinking naively, like that twenty two year old, that surely we are going to jump right on this at any point. Um, and it's really been a snail's crawl. And I think we all know it. And the problem with the snail's crawl is that it takes time for a lot of things to happen. And if we cram it into a very short period of time, it's a lot more expensive. It is a lot more painful. There's a lot more arguing. And we've delayed and caused some climate issues that we, we probably can't back away from. And so delaying has cost us a lot of money. It'll cost a lot of lives. It, 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 it's really a big deal environmentally, financially, um, in a lot of ways. So with all of that knowledge though, still, all right, we're not moving again. I think you guys have got the screen back over to Zoom maybe, because we were having to deal with the chat. Go back over to mine. Ah, I think we're there. Uh, maybe not. I saw the cursor, so I thought maybe we were. Ha, ah, that might be it. Okay, I had the background, I had the non-political point of view on it, and yet I was still doing this. Um, and it was easy for me to look around at the world and say, oh, why are we not doing anything? But I really wasn't either. Um, and so I sat there just kind of thinking about it. I think I was really pretty busy playing my life's version of Bapa Mole. Um, but that's really not a great excuse because we, we all knew that things were kind of moving along and we weren't making a lot of changes. Uh, and then uh, Christmas, I think it was two years ago. My, my birthday is right before Christmas. And for my birthday, my husband, Stuart, over there surprised me with this really cool thing. It was in a manila envelope and it was a PowerPoint slide because, yes, I married another engineer. <laughs> and uh, it was really good. And what it did is it calculated our carbon load for the family. But in addition to that, and because there's a lot of different ways that you can calculate information out there, but in addition to that, he came up with a plan for how we could start reducing our carbon as a family. Um, it was really, really good. But even with all of the, or the thing that we learned actually during that process too, was we had an absolutely ridiculous carbon footprint. I don't mean big. I don't mean a little slighter bigger than the average, um, American average even. No, it was absolutely ridiculous. So that was pretty much the sound of, uh, you know, 
my head popping out of the sand. <laughs> um, so a couple other things to note before I move on about me is I'm really not a traditional environmentalist conservationist. I mean, it's not that I didn't agree with it. I just really didn't spend my time much thinking. And also let's face it, I was born on a farm in a very conservative state. I'm not crazy about regulation. I'm still not. Um, it has its purposes, but sometimes we get a little carried away with it more than sometimes. Um, I'm also not a climate scientist, um, but I don't view that as a problem in this case. We have a lot of climate scientists, but I am as an engineer, which makes me a problem solver. And I really enjoy it. Technical people create so much in the world. Um, and we understand the process that climate scientists go through. And yet we also um, don't always do a great job describing it to every, everybody else. Uh, nuclear power is uh, my favorite example. I remember younger in my career that we would all kind of tisk tisk everyone who didn't understand uh, nuclear power and uh, kind of condescending, how dare they think this is dangerous. And then we began to realize uh, well, how much have we done to really talk with the public about what risk really is, what the risk versus the benefits are of this. Um, what's being done to reduce risk, um, really an, a realistic view of the risk. What does it mean when we had an accident? You know, how serious was it? Why did it happen? What's happening in the industry to approve it? And so really scientists um, and engineers, like scientists are busy doing the science. Engineers implement those things. And we should be able to communicate with the, with the public about these. And so that's really the reason I decided to start talking. And um, the other thing I'm not is looking for a job. <laughs> I will admit, fully enjoying my retirement. Um, but I think sometimes that, and again, maybe it was the head popping out of the sand sound, is that sometimes you realize that I need to get moving. So the first thing that we did is started working on the family plan. And we've done quite a bit of that. And it's, we've really improved a lot. We are certainly not perfect, but I feel better actually moving. Instead of ignoring it, it feels better to move and do something than it does to ignore it. You don't have to be perfect. That feels good to get moving. The other thing I realized is that micro hurdles were really pretty common, um, you know, as far as acting out, you know, doing, making some changes and understanding the process. These were pretty, pretty common hurdles. Um, I also felt like what we really need on this global worldwide problem that we feel like we can't really impact is, is that we need to have local action. I can look at it and say, I can't really make much of a difference, but I don't think that's actually true. Um, and it's kind of an excuse. How my little particular carbon load isn't, you know, reduction isn't gonna save the world. And neither is even any work that we do within the state, all of us, but that doesn't excuse me from the role of trying to help. And in the end, we can do a lot more than we realize. Um, one of the things in our daily lives, the next topic to hit in our lives in the 2020s is really, and this is really Im impacting us, not just in our lives, but in how we view climate change is the information overload. We all feel it. I mean, I can pick up my phone and it is an amazing machine but the world is at my fingertips right there. Great information, garbage information, it's all right there. And it's a, it's a terrific thing, but it is also overwhelming us. And it becomes hard to see the forest for the trees um, as, long as, as well as some other things. So we're really drowning in the information and we need some structure to be able to process that. And if you look at that huge sand pile of information out there, we complain about social media and about, our, our news feed and our phone feeding us only stories that we wanna hear and see. And that is a problem. I mean, it puts us in a silo. You know, it really, it keeps us from hearing other, other points of view. But the reason it's there is there's just so much information. So how do we filter and how do we come to that? And that's what all those systems do. We just have to recognize that they do it in a way that isn't always productive and that that's the situation that we're in. And it's still really not the best system either. We need to do better. This is how my brain structures things. <laughs> if you have a technical background or even other backgrounds that do this, you will recognize this right away as a work breakdown structure. It's just, I just put it up as an example. That's the way I think of the world. I need colors. I need spatial orientation. I have a lot in my mind. I, I have to have a picture that goes to it. Um, when I was running Walsh Engineering, the, the joke was always that I really couldn't think if I didn't have a whiteboard and a pen in my hand. 
you know, whiteboard to, to scribble all over. Even if my scribbles didn't make sense, to me, they helped me uh, process a lot of information, be able to clarify it and communicate it out. So I felt that for this conversation, that we needed to have a bit of a framework and that it isn't just based on the science because there's clearly a lot more going on than just the science. The way I look at this is we've got the science first and foremost. We've also got maybe not first and foremost, maybe first and foremost is our brains and how they work and how we perceive information, how we process information. I actually really like this part of the topic. I'll try not to drone on too long on that part. Um, the third is really, let's bring it home. Let's see what's actually happening in Idaho. It can seem so abstract when you see these global numbers. And to be honest, we tend to be fairly isolated in Idaho on a lot of problems that happen in the world. Um, so let's see what's actually happening here in Idaho. And the last area was action. Runs a little slower. We're okay. Okay. So let's get into the basics of how we think. It is really more than just the science. I've got two topics really on how we think. Oh, how we decide. This is, um, again, this is my favorite part. I read a book about 10 years ago and it was called How We Decide. And the thing that there's so much good stuff in it, if you ever see it, it's really worth um, reading. Uh, a lot of the no, new neuroscience that's coming out is just fascinating, or habits, all kinds of things. Um, but the thing that stuck with me out of this book was, was really a lot about our emotional brain. And what he calls it is our supercomputer. And it really is. It's our emotional and our kind of automatic brain. And then we need to understand the difference between that and our logical brain, which is like our prefrontal cortex, right? So there's the old animal part of our brain, things that automatically work. And then there's the processing and language part. And they have very different functions. And this supercomputer of our emotions is amazing, but it has limitations, just like our logical brain is. Um, I remember in the book, he said, we think that we make most of our decisions logically, but in reality, we make most of them emotionally or automatically. And when you really start breaking down your day, you begin to realize that that's true. And sometimes that is not a bad thing. I, most of the time, it's actually a really good thing. We couldn't drive to work or to the store if we had to sit and think about how do we operate our car? How do, you know, how do we do all these things every day? So that automatic mode is actually really beneficial. Um, so why do we use that brain so much if most of the time that's how our decisions are made? Um, there's a couple of reasons. One is energy usage. Our brains are like 2% of our body weight and they take about 20% of our calories. So clearly our brain is chugging away and working hard. And because it's doing that, it needs the opportunities to make shortcuts, to make quick decisions. Um, the other one is the speed of decisions, the quick decisions. I'm gonna give you, this is my favorite example on how our brains do us a favor with this ability to make these quick decisions. If I had to think about like, for example, how to hit a baseball. So I'm five years old, six years old, whatever, when I first learned to hit a baseball and that ball comes at me, I don't do a great job. And then over time, as you practice, you begin to you know, get the hang of it. And once I hit that ball and that, I mean, that hits, I get the ping, the emotional positive ping, like, whoa, this is exciting. I just hit the ball. Well, that emotion is part is what teaches me. Um, that's why a kitten plays. It, it's, it's a survival thing. It, it teaches them how to hunt. We're built to enjoy those things that, that, that teach us what we need to do. So if, that base, if I had to use my logical prefrontal cortex for that ball, you throw the ball at me and I'm having to think about, okay, how fast is that coming? I mean, all of the thought processes that go in, how do I hold the bat? Okay, now here it comes and actually be able to connect the ball and the bat at the same time, it would obviously never happen. So again, this is an amazing supercomputer. Now let's go back to our sand pile of information data. We are poured in with information all the time that our logical brains would be better off processing than our emotional brains. Um, there's a lot out there. So how do we process that? What brings things to the top of the sand pile? Have any guesses? It's motion. 
especially when we're in a hurry playing bop a mole. If I have to make a quick decision, I'm going to make it quickly, whether it's an emergency or anything else. I'm going to make that quick decision quickly and probably emotionally based on past experiences and how I feel, what feels right. So the problem with things like the internet is the emotion isn't really the proper way to, to structure that. Um, and the most effective emotion is really the negative emotions. Anger, fear, hate, those are, those are ways to get our attention. That's why the news will constantly bring up, I don't care if it's murder hornets or anything else, you know, it's bringing up these things like they're a huge deal. Well, it's a way of getting our attention, but it's a really improper way of getting our attention. But without this slower feed of information that we had in the past and some structure, a class, a book, things like that that we could go to, we're just swimming in this immense amount of data. And, and we aren't even, it isn't even just because we're looking for it, it's the time shoved at us. Or I voluntarily let it shove, shove at me because I'm flipping through my, you know, swiping right, I guess, to get the news. Um, but all of that information is constantly changing and constantly coming at us. And it puts us in a high state of alert, even if we're not aware of it. So it makes us not make particularly good decisions. Okay, there are a lot of mental errors and biases. I have a million of these, and I'm not going to go through them just for the sake of time. But I do want to hit a couple of main ones that impact us probably in daily life, but certainly in climate change. The biggest one I hear is, is kind of this black and white thinking, this yes and no, one or zero. And it comes into play even on um, is climate change real or not. You know, and, and the fact is, we want a quick answer. And we kind of need a quick answer. You can't analyze every single thing out there. But that black and white thinking is also comes into play in like red team, blue team. What do I believe? Is the red team telling me I'm a conservative? Is the red team telling me this? Or is the blue team telling me this? And it's, it's these shortcuts and they make perfect sense. But in some cases, they really, it isn't appropriate thinking, especially on something as important as climate change. It's again, the big mole with teeth. Um, we talked, I think everybody's aware of this one, how social media feeds are confirmation bias. And there's different kind of pieces to that that kind of fit under it. Um, if I see though what I want to see, I can, and I continue to see it over and over again, then I'm of course gonna believe it more and more and more. It confirms what I emotionally believe and that's what keeps me in my silo. And so to be able to step back and take the time and say, okay, maybe my silo isn't really got everything correct. Um, is really important. Force for the trees, that one comes in a lot in climate change is issues. Um, false equivalency, this one's really important too. I'm going to use the example of there's X percentage of climate scientists who say that um, climate change is caused by human activities. And then there's this other portion that says, no, it's not, it's not caused by us, it's natural. If those were 50-50 arguments, if the science was really split and there was a half consensus yes and half consensus no, well, first of all, the science, scientists, climate scientists would not be saying this is real if that were the case. But if it was a 50-50 split, that's a proper equivalency. But when it's in the 90 plus range, for me to give it equal weight in my mind is probably not reasonable. And, but it is a natural bias that we have. We're either gonna go yes or no, or call them equal which is the half and half kind of. Um, now, sometimes that actually, that, those bi these biases, by the way, can lead us to appropriate information. The point is to say, is that an appropriate bias or not? Uh, one of my biases is optimism. Um, I have the optimism bias. I really believe that we can work our way out of this one. Um, as an engineer, yeah, I love to solve problems. I think we can solve this, but I don't wanna be stupid either. Is it gonna be perfectly easy to solve? No. Um, we're going to have some hurdles as we go along. Um, I won't go into the rest of these just for sake of time. There's a million though, and I didn't even put down the small part. A blind spot bias. That is the bias, by the way, that says, I don't really have a blind spot. That one's important for everybody to recognize. So back again to there's, there's more to this than just the science. Part of this is how we think. And we talked about the emotional and the biases and the speed of thinking, our emotional brain versus our logical brain. 
there's another part to it. And that's how we make sense of the physical world. So for a very long time, people have been trying to make sense of the world. That's where math comes from. You know, we, we start with counting and, you know, numbers. And, and eventually this leads to the ability to really understand things better and to predict what, what may be coming up. Um, so just a couple of basic scientific kinds of things are worth noting. This actually is my favorite. I, my kids grew up with me constantly saying that, remember that risk is probability times consequences. Or in this case, I think this one actually came from the insurance industry. It's the likelihood of something happening and the severity of something happening. So again, this is not black and white thinking. This is, so this is uh, what degree, what shade. So for example, if climate scientists are saying um, this is a very, very high probability, I don't really personally care if it's 90 or, or 99%. It's not that I won't look at those lower amounts, but when it comes to calculating risk, it, it probably doesn't change my decision of what to do. Um, I wanna know why some people or some scientists may not believe it, but it doesn't mean I'm gonna spend a lot of time um, evaluate, not equal time at least. But I do wanna look into it. I wanna understand, I wanna see what's going on, but it doesn't change to me whether or not I'm gonna start taking action or not. Because the worst thing that happened is maybe it goes down a little bit from the bright red to the pink. But is that based on the likelihood or is it based on the severity? And I think severity is not really being argued much. It's really likelihood. There we go. Another um, nice little scientific math thing to understand of how scientists put things together is there's usually error bands around data. So you'll see like scatter plots of the temperatures and things like that. Um, it's important to understand that's there. Um, an error band may be 5%, 10%, I mean, whatever it is that matches the data. It, but if there, is an error, if there is an error band naturally around data, it doesn't necessarily mean the data is wrong. What it means is you're looking for trends. So when we look at global temperatures, you may see it you know, go up and down a little bit, but what you're really looking for is the trend. Or the confidence interval, by the way, is probably a better term for that space in between. How confident am I in data that I'm putting out as a climate scientist? How confident am I of what the acidity level in the ocean is gonna be? Okay, um, I forgot I have this one too. This is actually a data evaluation and presentation. So how we present, how data is presented to us may make us see things one way or another. Um, this one comes from, uh, there was a politician in, which I think helps us kind of understand what politicians go through sometimes, but he was in Australia and um, some people that did not want to see climate action presented him with the graph on the left. And I 100% would have concluded the same thing in his shoes. I have a million different topics to be concerned about. Um, and someone shows me this graph that says, look, the CO2 is rising, but the temperature's not at that. That's not really happening. Um, and his reaction was just what we would expect. It was like, why are we about to spend a bunch of money dealing with something that isn't, it isn't necessarily even correlated. Okay, then go to the graph on the right. You guys, and that is, you can see the temperature anomalies. You see the temperature rising with the CO2. Can you tell, I, you know, the graphs are small, but can you tell why those two graphs look so significantly different? Span of time, yes, bing, bing. The one on the right goes back uh, to about 1964. And again, you can go back further and we have a better graph of that later, but this was a nice concise way. That piece of data on the left is actually from, again, it's from about 2002 to 2008. It's a chunk, my pointer will work here. It's a chunk from right in here. Doesn't include this tail end either, by the way. And that, again, we have to be careful on both you know, sides of these discussions on any data of what's actually being presented to us. Is it representative of what's really going on? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the information age again for just a little bit now that we've had some of these terms. I don't wanna vilify this vast amount of information. I think it is progress, it is amazing. And let's face it, the information age has changed the world, is created 
a better world in most cases. It's created an enormous amount of wealth in the country because a lot of the stuff was developed here. It's one of the reasons I believe we should not be thinking around anymore about climate change is as a country, when we stay ahead of these topics and we lead the world, it helps us economically as not just us, but the rest of the world. And so to ignore and put our heads in the sand, back in the sand over, um, over climate change uh, is really detrimental in a lot of different ways. We have some great opportunities, um, but we have to realize we're really in the, you know, my cowboy picture, we're in the wild west of the data and information age. It is all developing so quickly. There is so much information. I read the statistic, but I don't think I brought the number of how much is added every day or every minute to the internet. There is a lot there. So controlling and keeping that organized and, and operating properly is of course gonna be a huge challenge. And that's just the phase of time we're in right now. I think over time that will get better. Um, we also have to recognize too that we really want that freedom of information. Perhaps not just, let's not go black and white. We don't control it in, in, a, in a crazy amount and, and really you know, hold a tight rein on that. But a complete open end of freedom of information is a little crazy too. I think the debate is how do we control that and, and maintain as much freedom as we can, but stop certain things that are detrimental um, to us. And a lot of times, like right now, what it really depends on is us being smart consumers. Um, I did a quick diagram here of what it normally would take to go from a scientific piece of information, let's pretend it's not climate change for a minute, into action. And I'm gonna call it action like political action, but it's not just political. There's a scientific method that goes on um, that climate change has been through quite a bit um, and most science has been through quite a bit. Um, and that process takes time. Uh, this topic has been going on for quite a long time. Like I said, I learned it in college 30 some odd years ago. Um, there's a lot that we've known for a very long time. There's still things that are being developed. A lot of the details, what's gonna happen with the ocean currents, how quickly will the ice caps melt? Those are the trees. And those maybe we don't have as much certainty on. But we've been through a lot of this in the scientific method. And normally what would happen is that information would get communicated and um, usually through uh, scientific journals, at least in the past. Now, apparently we can put anything out anywhere. Um, and our public awareness and political awareness raised. And eventually that leads to policy. Hasn't really done so in this case for a lot of different reasons. Um, Right now we have a lot of kind of misunderstanding over what the issues really are. Um, there's a lot of misinformation sometimes. Um, if I use COVID as an example, part of the reason we had this problem or we've had this problem of reaching some kind of a consensus is because it isn't as mature as some other sciences. And when the virus came out, it's not that we didn't understand viruses and contagion, but really this one was new. Everything's coming out quickly. I, fully am not surprised that there's a lot of debate over, especially in the public realm, over what's real and what's not. It's all happened super quickly. Aside from the fact that we are in this free, you know, wild west of information. Um, there's also always competing needs. Sometimes things go to policy and of course there's financial needs, sometimes legitimate, sometimes financial influencing. But if we look at why we didn't get from the data a long time ago to action, like you, this normal process, there's a lot of these things that happen. And, and the thing that I think adds to it is we are a carbon-based economy. Um, I'll go into this a little bit later, but let's face it, hydrocarbons are an amazing fuel. They just are. Um, and so, you know, switching a basis for our economy is, is not, is not going to be easy and it's not going to happen without a bit of a fight. Okay, so that's kind of the basics of, of the science. I didn't want to go too deep because in the end, or sorry, the basics of how humans, where am I? Am I in the science? No, now I'm ready for the science. There we go. Sorry, a lot of into how we process information. Um, okay, so the basics of the atmospheric science are, is the earth really changing? Why do we think it's caused by humans? And is there really a scientific consensus? So let's take a look. I think a lot of you have already seen this graphic. This is actually what is the greenhouse effect. 
the atmosphere has been on the earth for a very long time. It turned this from a cold rock to a really terrific place to live. Um, the radiation from the sun comes, heats the earth. Some of that bounces off. Some of that's absorbed by the earth. And then, especially at night, um, that as it begins to radiate back out, the blanket of CO2 and other greenhouse gases like methane, they hold that in. And that keeps our world quite nice and toasty. Um, the thing that I had actually, by the way, I don't know if you guys have probably all seen this one, but if you, the one thing that finally hit me and I'd never realized is, well, why doesn't the blanket work equally one direction as the other? Why does that allow additional buildup? If we thicken the blanket, why doesn't that block the sun more? And it really just has to do with the, um, the wavelength of the energy. So we're still effectively by adding more uh, greenhouse gases, we're still allowing this heat, most of this heat in, we're just trapping more of it. This one's really key too. The constituents in our atmosphere are 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and only 1% of the others like argon, CO2, methane, and water vapor. And those are the greenhouse gases. So think about that for a minute. It's 1% of the atmosphere, and yet it is highly important. It is really a really sensitive system. It's very sensitive to those greenhouse gases. That's what traps the, the heat in. That's what created the planet but it's really sensitive at only 1%. The average temperature of the earth right now is 59, about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Anybody have a good, good guess as to what it would be if we didn't have the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere? Be zero, 59 degree difference. So the point of that is it's a really highly sensitive system. When we add CO2 into the environment, it's not, a, I mean, if we were adding nitrogen, it's really not a big deal because it's 78% nitrogen, changing it a little bit is not changing much. But when you change this highly sensitive uh, constituent of the atmosphere by a gross amount, it has to have an impact. We can't put this much into the environment of anything really without an impact, but certainly not of our atmosphere's most sensitive constituent or, or a couple of them, those greenhouse gases. That right there to me is the nutshell of why I could not walk away from climate change. Like I, could, I, I couldn't look at those, that percentage of people that think, hey, maybe this isn't real. Because in the end, it goes back to this, how sensitive the planet is to those gases. And how much we really have. Seems to be frozen. Okay, let's talk about the carbon cycle, the natural. No, did I skip that one? Sorry, a little technical difficulty on my part. Um, I'm gonna go through these a little quicker because they're, I think people have seen them a lot. This is from NASA. Um, and this is the, the bigger curve of those smaller ones. And if you look at that, this is the years before today. I, one of the arguments I've heard, um, and it's really actually a reasonable argument is, well, the CO2 level was doing this then. There was a volcano that went off. There's, there's this addition and that addition. But in the end, nothing adds the kind of quantity that we've been adding grossly year after year by this amazingly wonderful hydrocarbon fuel that is cheap, versatile. Um, it's the basis for our economy. We add so much of it. And you can see that in the spike to the far right. Um, I've seen some other ones that I'd have played if I had time that really show that a little bit more with the prediction levels too. The fact, the fact is it's also a finite fuel, but we've got a couple of reasons to start um, curbing this. Let's skip this one. Uh, I liked this one too. We talk about the Earth's temperature kind of, you, you know, here's the single points of the temperature, here's what's going up and down. You have to recognize too, it does change across, around the planet. Um, if you specifically look at where Idaho is, we're about in that one degree, you know, a half to one, one to two degree range. Um, look down here, there's a nice little blue spot. I could just put, point my data to that and say, look, we are cooling. Um, and up here, we're seeing in the red. Why is that scary? Yeah, that's where the ice caps are. 
So if I walk out if in Idaho, I don't feel it as much. I don't feel that temperature difference as much. There are places in the world that are. That graph, by the way, looked like it was out of my college days. It's been around. Okay, the natural carbon cycle. In the center here, if you haven't seen this already, is the natural carbon cycle. We've got plants that take up the CO2 from the atmosphere, animals that eat the plants, and then uh, we as animals breathe out some CO2, but also when the animals and plants decay, they release some CO2. Um, but we also have this part that ended up getting buried into the ground and turned into fossil fuels. But the natural part of the cycle is here. By the way, excess CO2 in the atmosphere does end up in the ocean. And that happened before we were adding hydrocarbon. Uh, we were using hydrocarbon fuels too. And the acidity level may you know, raise and lower a little bit. But that natural system was built with this inherent balancing. So Krakatoa goes off, you know, we have these other major events really the, the earth could self-heal. You could just balance. We had an ice age, we had this, we had that. There is that natural up and down. The problem is, is that we took what had been stored over a very, very long length of time and we went, oh, this is great stuff. And we began to just burn it quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker. So we began to overload that system. And that imbalance is what's really giving us a problem. The earth doesn't have enough time to I mean, this in geological time that would normally those cycles would take place, we, you know, we could maybe recover, but certainly not the volume that we're putting in without changing it, and certainly not in the time frame that we need it to go back. And that's where we hit a tipping point question comes from. The carbon cycle is one that I've taught a little bit in schools as well. I think that is another one of those very root issues. Um, that people need to understand. Uh, a little quick note, we know the difference between climate and weather. I walk out tomorrow and it is a cold day. That does not mean that the earth, Idaho is not warming. I think we know that. Um, and then went a little bit on that scientific consensus. My computer's going slower um, issue. Um, I wanna explain this one because I hear a lot of debates over what is the consensus? This actually, this study, this was a paper written in 2015 and it was based on seven different consensus studies where they went out and they asked, uh, I think they would ask, maybe they went through their literature. But anyway, they came up with these different numbers and the, you gotta look at this and say, why is there such a variance? And there's number, what, what are those error bars from? And as it turns out, it was the difference in how each of those studies had defined who an expert is. Because you got to, here's a curve too that came out with them. As you go up, the people know more. It is interesting that as you, you become more of an expert, you agree more in climate change. Well, you know, to look at people that their, their scientific area really isn't related to this, you really got to cut that off somewhere. And each of those studies had done that a little, defined this a little differently. And that's why we have the variation. I think we need to, I think it's very common to look at those numbers and go, well, nobody can decide what that number really is. Well, it really just depends on how they collected the data. It's a pretty high number. By the way, that if we, the average that's usually quoted now after that, that is one of the landmark studies is 97% of, of consensus on climate change is, is human caused. That is a really high number. Go back to the risk matrix. That is plenty high for me to say I'm good. There was a recent literature study, and this was like last year, um, might've been two years ago, um, that there's 88,000 studies that were out there. And they went through those and they looked for how many were either implicitly or explicitly negative on human cause of climate change. Not just is it happening, but are we as humans causing it? And out of that, they found 48 studies, 28, forgive me. 28 studies that said that. They went, wow, that is 99.9%. And um, so that's a lot higher number than was quoted a few years earlier in a, in a separate study. Um, I don't really, frankly, need it to be 99.9%. The risk is there uh, regardless. They also, by the way, looked at those studies that had come out on the negative side, and it was 
um, they were studies that uh, had been only published in minor journals. The data was not reproducible or there were errors in the data. So these were not, these were not studies that came out in major scientific journals, which is the filter for good information. You have to be verifiable. Um, that's how you get good data. Well, one of the ways. So my conclusion on that, by the way, is yes, we do have scientific consensus or close enough to, 100% is necessary for scientific consensus, not even close. Okay, that's the basics of the science. Now let's bring it home and look at what's happening in our backyards, in our state. Um, the temperature has definitely risen. Uh, the precipitation pattern has definitely changed. It's not our imagination. Uh, the snowpack has declined. Uh, and on top of that, we are having a population boom. There's a lot of reasons for that population boom, but it does put a lot more stress on our systems in Idaho. Um, in addition, there was the Idaho Climate and Economy Impacts Assessment that just came out of the University of Idaho's McClure Center. And I love this thing because it was done not just nonpartisan, but very locally. And there were business, there was a lot of business support for it. Uh, people whose economic concerns are saying, okay, we need to really understand what is happening here. It isn't being influenced by the outside. We want to know what's really happening. And let's start getting a feel for what this is going to cost us and where it's going to hurt us. And that came out in December. So it's pretty recent. And if I had, I had more time, I'd bring it up and take a look at a couple of things. But all I can say now is just if you get a chance, go look at it. It's, it's web-based. It's, you know, you can click on the land or the water and see. They did some nice little snapshot, one or two page summary sheets, but then the depth of the report is there also. So they'll have great scientific studies. And what they found is that our annual mean temperature has risen by 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And the prediction by 2100 is six to 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that is less than 80 years from now. My mother is 80. That is not that long from now. And that is a big, I mean, if we've already seen 1.8 degrees and it's having the impacts that we're gonna discuss in just a minute, six to 11 is a big deal. And by the way, that's based on the models that they use and how much, you know, how much they have to assume in, in carbon reduction that we're gonna see, or we're gonna see a lot or a little. Um, they didn't use the most uh, optimistic that we would be really tackling climate change quickly. Um, they used the, the next two up. The other point to note is that since 1990, seven of the 10 hottest summers in the industrial age um, have been in that last 30 years. So it's getting hotter. Uh, this is a nice graph that I borrowed from the climate assessment where you can see again, the trends. So yes, we are. And again, if you want more detail, we only have so much time, please go look at the study. Um, water is the lifeblood of Idaho. I mean, I think you don't have to have grown up on a farm like me to know that how important water is um, to the entire West, certainly to Idaho. Um, little water rich potatoes would not be growing here if we weren't irrigating. Um, there's some things we could grow, but not a whole lot. And what happens, with climate warming is that our snowpack is affected. So it is already warmer and drier, but now imagine what's happening. And, and yeah, they have proven this is, you know, they do see this already. Um, that snowpack starts, decre it starts decreasing earlier in the year. It starts melting early in the year. We get more rain on snow events too. And so that water hits the system earlier. Now it's warmer, we need more, uh, air conditioning and our plants need more water. Irrigation is a huge use of water, obviously, in the states, in the state, and uh, the water usage needs are going to go up. So the impacts of the water supply changes. Again, this is directly out of the Idaho Economic uh, or Econ study. Uh, we are definitely going to see more drought. The projections show an increase in drought conditions. We're already in the middle of one at the moment. And again, drought may go up and down. It's the trends we're looking for. 
we're going to see a greater variability in rain and snow, a decreasing snowpack, and an increasing temperature. And that leads to less stable water sources for a lot of things. It also, by the way, leads to uh, lower water quality, which is a problem. We're going to have warmer and drier summers. and a lower stream flow. So it comes earlier in the year, that peak flow comes earlier in the year. And we're also going to be having less in the summer. So that peak flow is already moved to one or two weeks earlier, which gives us, again, lower flows in the summer and a compressed peak runoff. I think runoff is spelled wrong. As well as agriculture, uh, the energy demands in summer that are increasing, um, we have this additional problem of our hydropower being influenced. The hydropower is a big deal. Um, we are lucky, we have 76% of our power in Idaho comes from hydropower, it's a lot. So when we do something that impacts it, and again, it's not just a lower flow, but it's when the flow comes. I think actually water is, is probably to me the biggest um, impact to Idaho. Temperatures going up is a big deal, but we really need the water. Okay, the economic sectors impacted. I'm gonna go through these quickly. Um, ag, um, for ag, it really, we're kind of uh, regionally sensitive and crop dependent. Um, I think down in our area, we're actually not supposed to be in the Idaho Falls area affected quite as soon. Um, and then also they've said that uh, onions are fairly sensitive, that we really grow a lot of onions here um, and wheat will do better. So that's the kind of information that our farmers need to know. How are they gonna be able to adapt? Um, hydropower companies are already looking, they're already looking at how they're gonna deal with this. Um, infrastructure is a big deal. It, it can be damaged, it needs to increase anyway. We've got a population boom coming and happening now. Um, but also to deal with emergencies and other demands and just changing conditions. The water will, will change our hydropower conditions. Uh, rangelands, this one surprised me. We produce livestock on about 65% of Idaho's land. So think of what a drought does for that and the increased heat. There's less food, there's less water. Um, that is definitely gonna impact the animals and our economy. Uh, forests cover greater than 40% of our land. That one didn't surprise me too much. I will say though that to me, although we have risk of what climate change is doing to us, that one actually provides us an opportunity. We have 40% of our land covered in forests. There's been a delay in carbon offset payments and you know that whole process and how that's gonna work out. There's a lot to still deal with, but that's an opportunity that if we have that much forest that Idaho should be able to gain from that. Um, the problem we're, we're going to suffer from, though, is obviously the wildfires, the insects, um, the pathogens from drought uh, and increased heat are really going to change our forests. And they're having a hard time, really hard time predicting exactly what that's going to mean. Certainly not in dollar amounts, but, you know, they, they know what happens to trees when it gets hotter or drier. But it's a little harder to predict beyond that. And I don't know about you, but I am really tired of the smoke. Um, <laughs> I don't remember that at all when I was a kid. Not that we probably never had it, but because um, wildfires have already been here or been here a long time. And some of this is a buildup because we haven't, uh, we, we've probably overfought fires for quite a while. Regardless, the amount of um, fires that we're having now is increasing and will continue to increase. And that smoke will get worse. It's a health issue that I didn't get into here but it certainly is, um, and it impacts, um, actually even impacts energy production, um, tourism quite a bit. Uh, obviously the recreation tourism industry will be affected, um, even if you just look at the ski hills, their season gets shorter and shorter all the time. They can produce snow for a while, but it, it still gets really hard to keep something that expensive open that long and to cram their operating time into a short period. I'm gonna skip that. They're just, I found that exact, exact costs were really hard to find. Study didn't, I mean, I would have loved if the economic study came out and said X number of dollars to Idaho um, in X number of years. Um, but it's frankly, it's just not that easy. They set a really good baseline and gathered the data that they could. Um, I think there's just gonna to have to be more 
more money set aside to figure out more what we're going to see um, and let them start studying that as well. So the second half, that's what's happening in Idaho. We're seeing these changes. What's actually being done about it? And I think the short answer is not very much. Um, and I think we kind of all know that and, and can kind of understand a bit of the reasons. Um, but if you separate the what's being done in the Idaho into two sectors, one is how are we looking at adapting? In other words, just forget where it comes from. And politically, I think that is easier for a politician to be able to handle is to be able to say, look, we're just fighting fires, you know, um, and adapting to it. But even that can be risky for them. Um, and then there's the other side of preventing. This is reducing our carbon load. Not a ton going on there. Um, the coalition building is beginning, I think, in Idaho. And we, we need to start working on that tipping point. And I think the route for that, if you go back to our diagram that talked about the scientific process and then how that information gets transmitted, we've gotten in this loop. There is a huge gap between what the science actually says and what we as citizens understand and believe. If 97% of or higher of climate scientists say this is caused by human activity and probably much higher, then, and, and citizens were in the you know, 30, 40% a few years ago, now we're around the 60%. We've still got a pretty big gap and we've got to start closing that gap faster because for all that we may say about uh, frustration with, with different politicians on both sides at different times, um, the reality is that they will react or they need to react to what we, what we say and what we care and what we believe about. Maybe not me as an individual, but certainly us as voters and groups. And so if we don't begin to educate ourselves and be willing to step beyond the emotional uh, triggers and the fallacies that we have in our thinking to give this an honest look to say, okay, what's really going on here? And be able to communicate that to them in a, in a way that isn't red team, blue team, anger, fear. Um, they've got a lot of information to go through too and a lot to worry about. We really do need to be able to start building coalitions, teaching people, and then eventually that also can lead to political action. But I also think that we just can't wait for that. I think we just need to get moving regardless. Um, so if you look at what has been and hasn't been done in, in, in the government here, our state government, um, I think the thing that kind of made me the most uncomfortable was that they are unwilling to talk about it in the legislature in an honest, non-biased, non-emotional way. Um, it's just a little too soon for that, but we don't have a ton of time either. Um, but killing the educational science standards over a debate over them um, is pretty tough. And we're not, we don't seem to be working out that debate. We seem to just like, just put it aside and we won't talk about it at all. And it doesn't mean that teachers can't talk about it or teach it, but it's not really built into the curriculum and there's really not a standard. And I think we would rather have some of a standard. Um, it doesn't have some political, I mean, it, it needs to not be about politics. If it's about politics, we definitely need to strip some of that out. Um, but it really, the intention is to go with what the science really says. And then we need to get those approved again. Um, stopping the education is really not the right approach. Um, we do have, there is an effort on the adaptation side. Uh, governor, um, our governor has put through uh, a proposal for $150 million for wild, wildfire fighting measures over five years. May not be enough, but we do have to start looking at our forests because whether we like it or not, those are getting drier and need some cleaning out whatever good we can do with that, which is debatable. City governments, um, Boise is definitely in the lead. I mean, Boise has set a carbon neutral goal by 2050 and they've got a climate action roadmap. Not everybody's thrilled about it, but I, I don't know that I would expect everybody to be. Um, Idaho Falls doesn't have those things, but on the other hand, Idaho Falls power is 96 uh, percent renewables. Now they're only producing a third of that themselves at the hydropower plants here, which is a lot lower than I thought. But the rest they're buying from the Bonneville Power Administration, and that is uh, primarily renewables as well. And they're struggling a little bit with it too. I mean, all of Idaho, but also faces this too. But we have a population growth problem, which means more energy is needed. We have this limited resource of hydropower. And then we have intermittency challenges, which are only being made worse over time by climate change. Um, 
I don't really go into the solutions uh, technically that are happening in the world. I'm just trying to stick with Idaho. But the intermittency problem is real. Um, how do you, do you have to store? Again, it was one of the wonderful things about hydrocarbons, on, off, adjust, you know, you could do, it was portable, you could put it in a plant, a car, um, but those, those other costs uh, are really not worth it in the long run. The challenge we really basically face with power right now is storage. Um, but as an engineer, I do have to tell you, it's not that hard. Just, I mean, we look at batteries, batteries are not the only storage method. And batteries have advanced really quickly. I mean, it took us, we've had cars, uh, internal combustion engine cars for a hundred years or so. Electric vehicles at the end, at least once Tesla got in the game, really boomed quickly. And now the other manufacturers are being engaged in this too. So storage, batteries aren't the only storage, but look how far that technology has come. If you've ever you know, seen the energy equation, well, chemical energy is one of them. There's a whole lot of other ones. There's potential energy, and that's what pumped hydro storage is. Um, there's a lot of other options. We just have to get a little bit more creative and start making uh, that transition. And that's really what the energy transition is, is away from hydrocarbon fuels, down to renewables, and dealing with the new challenges of those. Um, nonprofits are actually doing quite a bit of, of work here. I'm gonna go through this quickly. There's about um, uh, quite a few actually that are working on about over nine, over 25 um, that are actively engaging this. And a lot of these are like existing, well-established um, groups, the Nature Conservancy, Idaho Conservation League, the Conservation Voters of Idaho. Um, there's a few others. Then there's a ton of little local, local groups. Um, ours is more local right now. We may be looking at all of Idaho, but we're really just functioning here in Idaho Falls at the moment. Um, there are chapters of the Western Resource Council. Portneuf Resource Council did a great thing. They did a solarized Pocatello where they put together their buying power. Um, they're looking at possibly doing another one. Um, it, it, again, I, I don't think that it's government's job to do everything. I think they need to do more than what they're doing right now, but it's great to see the nonprofits get rolling. There's also an Idaho Climate Forum um, where all of these nonprofits get together and we all share. You know, a little bit of information and help coordinate. Uh, the tw in 2017, there was a climate summit. Um, those business leaders, uh, I'll show them, that helped fund the climate summit. There's some pretty good ones here. If you look, there's Simplot, HP, Micron, um, the outdoor industry. Um, there's, oh, the INL, of course. Um, these are terrific signs of them helping. They want to see the economic impacts, but they also want to be dealing with climate change. There's no denial of, are we facing climate change or not really in most businesses? There are in some, um, but it's certainly industries that are impacted. Um, they're kind of becoming that emerging force a little slowly. That's where I think we need more of the coalitions. That's a lot of, of our purpose. Um, the impact in industrial industries like agricultural manufacturing and forest products they're foreseeing economic uh, hurdles from this and they, they would like to see more information and, and when applicable, um, some action. I already talked about opportunities, I think for Idaho businesses and markets in the larger, in the larger world. Um, some of that we all know with the Idaho National Laboratory here, there is a lot of research here. Um, there is a lot of federal money coming in. So we'll see what happens to not just the INL but other federal entities within the state. Um, a lot of that research would be great if it, it comes to fruition um, out to the market. It needs to happen faster um, for all of the world, um, not just INL, but all of the research. Um, but I think that creates opportunities. Uh, my personal favorite would be to see uh, more carbon absorption technologies, carbon sequestration technologies. I think if we could extend our ability to use ca carbon fuels, it'd be great. They're really not a great technology. I think it's, we don't want to put too many eggs in that basket, if any, um, but I still think it's a great opportunity. Um, or maybe it's our natural solutions, it's our forests. Um, our universities, all three major universities worked on the uh, McClure Center's study. Um, they all have, and the reason they did is they all have natural uh, resource expertise, fish, forests, water, 
all of that. And um, they are the experts on what's, what's happening in Idaho. Uh, all of our local community colleges all have programs to train people. Um, if we're gonna, this energy transition is gonna take a lot, of, a lot of labor to get some things done. And we really want our future uh, students to be, and our, our kids to be able to participate in that uh, transition. And they're very interested. I mean, younger people are very interested. Sometimes the clicker doesn't do anything. There we go. Thanks, Caitlin. All right, what is next? I like my little Bill Nye quote, the less we do to address climate change now, the more regulation we will have in the future. I think that's a good reminder that we need to get moving. I think the first step in that is to figure out where we are. And I mean, collectively and individually, but if I look at us just individually, um, I fully expect like a range, even, even with this room, even with a group that says, hey, I'm, I'm interested in this, there's gonna be a range of where we are now. I'm hoping there's some great experts in here. If you're an expert, I would love to chat more with you. Um, join up with a group, mine, one of the other groups, whatever, and help get that word out. That, that gap between the technology and the public is real. And it's a big hurdle to why we're not really doing enough. Um, I have a notebook up here too, if we have any experts to leave me their email. Um, if you're more still on the skeptical side, I think it's fully understandable. Um, there's a lot for us to worry about in the world and there's a lot being shoved at us about uh, this issue, both pro, pro and con. And sometimes it's hard to really know. Um, my thought there is just to continue to look into it, be open, question it. Um, there's a lot to be gained. Okay, it's not moving again. Um, we do have to remember we are in this wild west of information, not necessarily to trust everything thrown at us. Look at your sources. Think about why we interpret data the way that we do and keep up with public discourse. You don't have to agree with me or anybody else on it. Um, that's how we all come to a better understanding, including me. Um, and finally, it, in this case, I think for skeptics, you have to recognize that it is important not to let this be made into a war. Everybody is, needs to chill out in a lot of areas in life right now, but there seems to be a tendency when we disagree with each other, particularly right now, to just fight it out and to keep pushing and pushing. A lot of that comes from just the tension of playing bop -a in our daily lives, um, the information overload. There's a lot that goes on there um, that we have to be able to step back away from and take this topic on its own merits and not on what someone else has explained to me. Um, it, sometimes it takes a little bit of research or asking questions. If you've got a friend that's got solar panels, my guess is they're gonna tell you what the economics of those solar panels really are. The vast majority of people though, I think, um, maybe not quite so high in Idaho, um, really is just ready to get started moving though. I mean, I know that's where I was. I believed it, I needed a little bit more data, but really it was, where do I get started? Um, and the first thing, Oh, where'd we go? Um, I'm not moving again. There we go. Okay, the first thing to understand is, um, if you're ready to get moving, is that what you do really is actually make a difference. It may not feel like it, but what you do as an individual really does end up impacting your community and your state. But if all you do is look at like, I'm just gonna go reduce a few things, that is still plenty of um, progress forward. And then, you know, a few months later, you might realize that there's something else I'd like to look at. Personal actions, if you're really ready to get moving, some of them are kind of simple and kind of obvious. One is though, I personally like much better to see my carbon footprint where I actually knew what it was and where it was coming from, because then we could make some decisions that would actually matter. I didn't feel like I was floating around just looking for, I don't know what's really gonna matter. Um, there are some apps out there right now too that help you not just calculate it, but measure how you're doing and how you're progressing. Um, make a plan for your carbon reduction. Um, if you're ready to get moving, there are some things that really make a difference. Switching to the renewables on your power bill for us made a huge difference. We ended up 
uh, doing uh, an electric vehicle too. And, and you know, there's some pros and cons with electric vehicles. And I think it, that decision has to be made um, pretty educated and it does take some time. You know, if you get ready for that, I think I'm finally at a position now where the first time somebody asked me, I'm like, I'm not sure I'm ready to answer those questions. I am a little bit more now. You're welcome to contact me um, or someone else that has an electric car. I will say there are certainly some trade-offs. People always ask about charging and things like that. Valid questions. I mean, it, it is a little bit of a pain to charge, but the trade-offs I gain, and not just in climate issues, the cars are a technology that really, if you pick the right one, it is there. The trade-offs are there. I love my electric car. I'd much rather have that. Climate change aside, that is an advancement in the technology. I don't want a horse and buggy. I don't want a 1920s car. I mean, this, this is the future and they're really terrific. Uh, you do though have to be careful, by the way. Um, I have a relative that bought a hybrid that had a battery and within a few months they were recalling the battery. And so you really wanna research that. And unfortunately for her, she went black and white thinking. At first it was like, yeah, this is a great car. And now all technology related to uh, the energy transition is all terrible, evil, bad. It doesn't work. Nothing works. That was such a flip the other direction. Instead of recognizing that this is an evolving technology and that that battery may not have been good. Perhaps even that company's batteries aren't good. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, there's also some... Um, uh, other things that are a little bit less expensive, just increasing your insulation, your light bulb, your power company probably has some good suggestions for that. Sometimes there's programs for doing it. The more expensive things like buying a car, you know, you may be not ready to do that now. Just kind of stay aware of them in the future. Um, the charging stations are increasing. Um, there's apps that'll show you where the charging stations are, but sometimes we just need those cheaper options. You want to be a conscious consumer, by the way. There's a lot of power in your power book or in your pocketbook. When we bought our electric car, it didn't just reduce our carbon load, it sent the market a signal, which is that we want electric vehicles. When Tesla got really booking on it, all the other electric, uh, all the other car companies had a million miles ahead of them on developing cars, but they gotten very complacent and settled and making money in their industry. And so they either completely ignored vehicles or they uh, kind of dabbled a little here, a little there, and, but really didn't die. But it wasn't until Tesla, and the market was actually there, it wasn't until Tesla began to raise that up and produce a great vehicle, people began to buy them, that the rest of the industry took notice and went, oh no, we better hurry and actually start rolling these out. I'm gonna be a little bit careful on some of the newer ones. My, I'm really excited that the Ford's coming out with an F-150. I mean, you look around and almost half of our vehicles are trucks. And we need trucks. And so those are great. The battery length is, and I'm not as long as it should be. The charging speed, not as good as it should be. It's still an advance. I think those are great. Recognize those are evolving technologies, but do your research, you know, take a look at those when you're ready for a car. Because again, you're not just doing a better job for yourself, but you're sending a market to a, a signal to the marketplace. Um, the other thing that you can do is join up. I personally felt a little bit like we were kind of on our own, like, there's us and the family, and then there's the vast internet. You know, it's just like, didn't feel like there was anything in between. You know, if enough of us get interested in this, I think it's good to, uh, we can do a little class where we all just kind of sit down and we all run our carbon calcs. We kind of learn from each other. We share some information on what we've done. That is a whole lot more fun than just trying to figure it out all on our own. Um, so we'll see, there's enough interest in that. We'll do that downstream here locally. Um, it's kind of fun to do it over a Coke or a lunch or a beer or a whatever your choice might be. And then the other one is to remember, I think that in, uh, perfection is the enemy of progress. Don't not start. Don't do anything just because, you know, ah, I'm not really going to tackle it. I'm not really going to dive in. It's okay. Just get started. Just make progress. And if you want to impact your community, by the way, joining up actually matters a lot there too. But consider yourself as the ability to influence others. You don't want to run out and preach, obviously. You don't want to go knocking on doors and saying, hey, you know, I really think you need to put up solar panels. Shame on you for not having an electric car. But if you become a little more knowledgeable, a little more trusted source, it helps us as a full society move a little bit quicker and a little bit better. 
Um, that's one of the ways that you can join up or you can just kind of chat with people a little bit occasionally. But I will say out of that, be aware. I think this is probably likely to end up a big, nasty, ugly political topic. It does not need to be, but it's a handy tool for them to pull out, pull, pull out of the toolbox on either side. This got politicized quite a long time ago, not just now, and um, for various reasons. And so, you know, I think we really need to be careful how we have these discussions, um, respectfully understanding of each other. What we really want in the end is we want to help get Idaho to the tipping point of understanding and the tipping point of action. And to do that, we kind of need to learn, discuss, make our switches, be able to talk to people. Um, and we also need to support progress in a way that understands that there are going to be some bumps and that's okay. Everything doesn't happen instantaneously. We didn't get great reliable cars in nearly, nearly as quickly as we've got great reliable electric cars. We're gonna have bumps in the energy transition as well. Help support that so when people are angry, you have some answers to that. And then I did throw out, reach out to legislators. I think that's a common one. I think when I look at what they face, I think uh, that influences whether I would say anything and how I would say it. I'm really personally not at the point of reaching out to legislators, but a lot of people are. And I think there comes a point where we do need to kind of consider that a little bit more at least so there's not so much resistance to it. Okay, I feel like I, like I dealt out the cards as quickly as I could. So maybe a little too much information. Um, Jeff asked if we could do a nice little Q&A at the end. Um, I did, by the way, put, if something hits you later, or even if you're sitting at home and you wanna email me now, um, there's a contact at dash us at idahosec.org. Um, or our website is up there too. It's uh, idahosec.org. Um, but if you have any questions now, this would be a great time to get them out too. Yes. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the most important things just. Oh, yeah. Um, the question was on electric vehicles. You still have to produce the energy. I mean, how do you look at that? How do you decide, you know, from a power production um, standpoint, environmental standpoint, how do you how do you look at that? And I'll tell you, the kind of first thing that that I look at is the fact that internal combustion engines for all of the wonderful things that this does for us. Um, they're really, really grossly inefficient. They just are. And you think about the heat that comes off of your engine, that's just wasted energy. Um, and so it is actually, uh, uh, it is a better use of hydrocarbons, <laughs> even if I don't wanna see them used at all, it is a better use of hydrocarbons in a plant that produces electricity because that plant is so much more efficient. You have a little bit of losses in the lines, transmission lines as well, but it is still, so even if your power company is not using renewables, um, it is still a more efficient way to utilize those hydrocarbons. Does that answer your question before? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, on, okay, Jason, efficiency of scale on energy production or on any of the technologies that need to be developed? Okay. Production of energy for electric cars. Yeah, he was. Um, yeah, I'm still, I, I guess I'm not quite sure how to answer that, Jason. You think so? Okay. Okay. Yeah, and that kind of speaks Okay, I think if we understand you're right, Jason, I think that sounds, um, 
a lot of that is the maturity of a technology. And, and I, the best analogy I think a lot of us have heard is when the phones first came out or a calculator, we bought our first calculator in college, ridiculously expensive. And then over time, yeah, as more of them get bought, they get more efficient, the production gets better. Um, but yeah, that's, um, that's certainly gonna make a big difference in, in the production of the cars. And Jason, if that did not answer your question, feel free to uh, go ahead and put, oh, a big power plant is better than a small, and small electric generators, if I understand correctly. Uh, maybe um, a big power plant may, yeah, probably uh, it, it depends on the power. As a general rule, is a bigger, more efficient, usually, not always. Um, in a car though, yeah, thanks Chris, I see that. Bless you. <laughs> There's a lot of cupping going on. Oh. Okay, so I sometimes have disagreements with some of the uh, the other people um, that I begin to work with because I'm pro nuke. Um, there's obviously some disadvantages to nuclear. Um, the cost of producing a power plant. I think people don't realize how much of our electricity already is um, done in a, um, in a nuclear power plant, and that those are aging that we need to replace them. I absolutely do believe that we need to be promoting more. I think one of the nice things is it solves so many problems. One of the problems that people don't think about is high temperature um, applications. Uh, you know, we use gas uh, or we burn fuel to get to the high temperatures to make steel, for example. Uh, we're not gonna do that with solar. You know, that just isn't really feasible. Um, I think nuclear is a great, um, that's a, so I think, yeah, absolutely in specific applications. Sometimes there is still a fear of nuclear, which again, I think we need to do a better job at communicating, but we also need to recognize that it is not a zero risk technology either. It just needs to be managed correctly. Okay, what's the next? Okay. Next question we have, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, I think the, the basic question, yeah. Yeah, the basic question is, is when we grew up, uh, we were educated on certain things that maybe aren't being really taught right now. Um, there's a lot of question everything that you run across, which I think we can see why. Um, and we've kind of lost the sense of a base of truth. One of the reasons I wanted to present the basics of climate science is because that really is, you know, the carbon cycle, those are kind of irrefutable, you know, facts. And I think those are the kinds of things that kids should be taught. And that um, being removed from the science standards in Idaho, I think we were the first state to do that was of a few, is a little bit scary. Yeah, a, a lot of that comes from this information age that we talked about too. Um, what I'm surprised with though, is how often the kids still get it, even with the changes in education, even in the changes with how, you know, how we sort through things and the influences of emotional you know, arguments, um, how often the kids still really get it. But should education be improved? Yeah, I think, I think there's a million ways that we would be all happy, I think, if education were improved. It's a good question. Kate, oh, go ahead. Change. To me, there's black and white change. 
Yeah, me too. That's a good comment. Okay, um, to repeat that. Um, oh, the question from the audience is, are humans causing climate change or just contributing to it? Um, is uh, Caitlin's summary. I think that's pretty good. Um, first of all, I think um, taking a closer look at those, those diagrams of the time frame is, is probably valuable and the differences of how much we're adding. Um, are we just contributing to it? And, and that's, you know, his, his other point, by the way, to the audience online was maybe that black and white thinking of we're causing it, we're not causing it really is causing a lot of people to turn away from it. And so let's take it out of a yes or no black and white and say uh, that we are contributing to it. That, and, and that is a much more accurate um, uh, statement. Perhaps the reason it's okay to simplify it a little bit to that is, um, and I've kind of struggled a little bit with that too, is how much are we contributing versus how much is this is a natural thing. And, uh, you know, th there's really not natural, I've never read yet a natural source argument that convinces me that it plays enough of a role to, and besides, I can't do anything about that one. But if we're at, if there's this much happening naturally, just to be totally scientific, this much happening naturally, and this much happening um, from human activities, um, then I'm really gonna focus on the human activities. And so it maybe becomes a forest for the trees argument. You are correct, I think that this black and white, it's all caused or none of it's caused is a bit of a problem. I think the generalization, generalization though still holds true because of the fact that really natural sources and it's really pretty small um, compared to the vast amount of, of carbon that we really are dumping in, in the atmosphere. And some of the natural causes I've seen discussed a little bit really don't have to do so much with the carbon and look again at how sensitive our atmosphere is to those greenhouse gases, really super sensitive to it. So again, we can't continue to dump a huge amount of something into that system and not affect a highly sensitive system to react in ways. Um, I think it was Lindsey Graham recently said something about, well, if it's not caused by human beings, we're really in trouble. Um, you know, he believe, I mean, he, he knows we're causing it. Um, which is funny because it's kind of a political argument, but when it really comes down to it, even outside of the political argument side, I think a lot of politicians really do understand. They're just stuck in an art spot. Yeah, I think absolutes have gotten to us in a lot of, yeah, that's a kind of the fallacy problem. Yeah. Um, let's get one from online for a minute. Um, do you want to, let's see, I guess I can look in the chat. Let's go to the first one asked in the chat if, if it was, unless it was Jason. Um, is that where we are? Thank you. Um, given the length of time the CO2 remains, is it too late and will we have to adapt? Um, yeah, it, it, to some degree it is too late and we will have to adapt. I mean, for me, the best thing in the world is we could come up with some great absorption te technologies. But if you picture, if I put a little blue dye, dye in, the, in a large body of water or a lot of blue dye, it's pretty hard to remove it. I mean, once you've dissolved this all out, it becomes really difficult to remove it. We can do a better job perhaps at the sources, that's fine. But the question of given the length of time the CO2 remains, is it too late? It is, uh, from everything I've read, it is probably too late to, cause, to, to go back to exactly what we had before. Um, is it too late to do anything though? That's back to black and white thinking. We do nothing <laughs> or we do everything. Um, we need to do as much as possible, but are we completely doomed or are we completely gonna solve it? Well, we're, we're probably gonna have a little bit of both. If we kick in, um, one, by the way, one of the best books I thought that covered the topic of where we are technologically 
how much change you know can we really affect where are these technologies is um bill gates's book is how to avoid a climate disaster um he just does a good job at, in pretty simple terms describing what he sees out in the world um where we need nuclear where he believes we need nuclear he's a pretty educated guy on the top but regardless he talks about what he believes um and where these technologies are and aren't and that's a good one um yeah too late's a good question too late for no damage yeah we're already seeing it and and how much can the earth recover this quickly we'll see okay what do we got next Please. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've looked at that one too. Um, it, you know, I, I think it's kind of almost a personal you know, question that each one of us kind of has to deal with. For me personally, I looked at it and thought, I, I don't think I'm willing to go down without a fight. Uh, you know, if I, if I want to continue to have this massive carbon load and spoil myself, which was really quite fun, um, and not even attempt, I, I just personally don't feel good about, about that. Um, I think, uh, it is easy to become a total pessimist. I, this is going to sound terrible, but I've never watched an inconvenient truth. And the reason I didn't watch it was one, I don't like that whole game being played in the political realm. It doesn't mean that I don't think that Al Gore was, you know, feeding from good information or, you know, really trying to affect change with his own platform. I don't, I don't have an opinion one way or the other about Al Gore necessarily. My problem with that is even though there was probably a lot of good done there, it made it a political argument. Um, and I just, you know, and so there are certain arguments that I have to stay away from. But I stayed away from that film because I didn't want to be emotionally pinged over to where I might become a total pessimist. <laughs> because I knew that right there would be the nail in the coffin for me that I'd be like, I'm done. Um, and I, I just don't want to live that way. So I, I think that's a valid question for everybody. Um, I think if you if you get a chance to read Gates's book, though, it, it actually did make me feel better. And now he's another engineer, so he's probably got similar bias to what to what a lot of us have, which I feel like we could we got a problem, we can tackle it. We just got to get on it, you know. Um, so that's my bias, but I like that bias, so I'm going to keep it. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Geothermal? Oh, yeah. 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 But the cost of that was about five. So the question has to do with um, seeing. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. The comment and the question, I should say, you had a good comment there, was that he um, has observed or seen in the news some of these carbon sequestration um, uh, technologies, uh, the one in Iceland that opened recently. There's a great one in Canada that caught that I end up reading quite a bit on too, and. What the costs of them are and everything and 
And I actually think there is a lot of promise. It's one of the, this is my personal bias. I would love to see us work on those more here in Idaho. Um, there is some work at the INL being done on uh, a technology. Um, I think there's places all around uh, the world that, uh, that like to look at those and are work, working on them. I think it's an emerging technology that we are gonna hear a lot more about. Now, I'm gonna give you my, my most angry black and white discussion that I heard. And it actually came out of a pro-climate um, change action person. And his comment was, how dare we be focusing on technologies like, like, uh, like that? Um, that all of our money should be going to stopping um, production of carbon and that this was, should completely be stopped. It was a really very angry response. And I thought that is the silliest thing I've ever heard. We really need to do both. If my, if my brain can't handle the thought of reducing carbon at the same time we're trying to pull it out, then I'm not thinking very hard. Um, I think they put him on the news because he had emotionally angry argument and it was a silly one. Um, we need to develop both. Um, you know, to, to the point that perhaps he was making though, that, that was actually legitimate aside from my annoyance was, um, if we, if we think we can over rely on that, we're wrong. That, again, if, we're t if we've got a little nice technology that removes the blue dye from a lake that we just poured some dye in, lovely, but, but it really is better to stop it before it goes in. Um, but realistically, we're gonna have to pull some out of the atmosphere, I believe. Um, and, uh, uh, and it does kind of expand our ability to use carbon fuels maybe a little bit longer, especially if we can put them on a power plant. So, um, but yeah, I have seen those technologies. I personally believe they are gonna advance. I think there's such a huge need. Whenever there's a human need for something, we tend to put our focus on it and do a pretty darn good job. Engineering bias. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do we have another? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah, Melissa's asking. Yeah. Yeah, I unfairly blew past the health argument because it isn't so much my area. And I'm, by the way, I didn't recognize you, Melissa. I honestly thought you were 25 years old girl showing up. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, no, uh, uh, Melissa is a, uh, a nurse. Um, and remind me what level? Nurse practitioner, I wanted to say an RN. I'm like, that is not right, um, a nurse practitioner. And um, so her health, her question was really about the health topic that I breezed past so quickly. And it really is big. And Melissa, that climate economy study um, uh, done on Idaho has a much better section. I just kind of knew I couldn't do justice to it. But if you get a chance, go look. Um, the health industry, they're trying to help decide how much it is gonna cost the health industry. But aside from cost, because again, the focus of the study was cost. Um, aside from cost, yeah, the most vulnerable populations suffer the most. 
And so I may go out and the smoke may bug me. I don't like the way it looks, but as I get older or if I'm sick or anything else is happening, it can, and our smoke levels are, we're gonna see more of it or up and down, but we're gonna see more of it. Um, it absolutely is a huge health issue. And I really haven't done it justice in the talk. It is enough of the topic, by the way, that one of the sponsors for uh, that study was out of the health industry. Ooh, I am guessing Barry knows more about that than I do. Okay. Um, you know, I have heard a little bit on that, but not enough that I could speak intelligently at all. So Barry, my email address is on there. I will do some research. And if you know more, please send me an article or two out of good, reliable sources. Um, I think there's something to that question that I would really like to learn more about. Yeah, it is Steph, S-T-E-P-H, at, or actually, I think I did also, or you can do contact-us at Idaho, S-E-C, dot org. And S-E-C, yeah, dot org. Yeah, when you type it in, I'll verify when it pops up. Um, yeah. There we go. And our website is out there too, under www.idahosec.org, and that's got a contact information as well. Yeah, go ahead, Christy. I think I'm just scared of it. Yes, actually, and that's another reason for me not to do it. Not only would I not be good at it, and it kind of scares me, um, the Idaho Conservation, or the, sorry, the Conservation Voters of Idaho does that. Matter of fact, too, they put out a really good newsletter, too. They follow our local legislature, and, and, and again, whether you agree with everything they say or not, some of my friends might not. Still, it's a great source of information, and they are trying to protect uh, the conservation of our natural resources. I mean, if you grew up here or moved here, either way, I think we know what a beautiful place we live in. This is one of the one of the reasons that everyone's moving here. This is a beautiful place, and we want to deserve it. And they've been on that game for a long time. Uh, the guy who who leads that area to uh, Ryan is amazing. So yeah, definitely put your put your feelers out to them. Letters to the editor; those gain a lot of attention too, by the way. Hey, do we have any other questions? Okay, I think we've done really okay on time. Thank you so much. And one last thought is, um, again, I've got a little piece of paper. If anybody wants to email me, you've got that. If you wanna leave me your email address. I didn't really talk a whole lot about ISAC. We're still relatively young, but I would love some help. Um, I'd love any information that you have, like the article that we talked about tonight. And think about this, move forward. If you want to talk some more, you know where to find me. So thanks, you guys. <laughs>